So I'm not going to talk about this from an academic standpoint. I'm not going to do a comparison and a contrast between different territories. I'm also not going to tell you how the industry should work. I'm going to look at it from a <coughs> digital standpoint and from the standpoint of our clients who look to launch a music service. So it's going to be very practical. I am going to give a 30 second legal 101 on music rights. Um, I'm going to then give an introduction on where we sit in the ecosystem and why I'm qualified to talk to you about this in the first place. Then I'm going to go through the key issues which cause a headache to people looking to launch a music service. Then I'll provide a bit of context looking at the digital music market in general. Um, I'll look at digital expansion and how that's shaped publishing and how that's affected it. Then I'll come back to where we started, looking at rights at the forefront of everything. And finally, if we have time, I'll do a quick case study. So, publishing rights. 30 seconds. So, if you look at the uh, copyright onion, I don't know if you've seen this before, but you can apply this to any kind of copyright work. In relation to music work, work you can look at the layers on the onion, and think of the publishing rights, so the rights in the musical composition, the notes on the page, the song that's written, as the core of that onion. And then you can look at the sound recording rights around the center of the onion, and you can look at all of those different rights which you have to make sure that you obtain and clear before you start to exploit a musical work. So then, when we're looking at publishing rights as opposed to sound recording, the key rights that we need to look at are the reproduction right, also known as mechanicals, um, and the public performance right. So if you imagine you could also sell the onion whole or slice and dice that onion, sample a song, do a cover of a song, you've still got to get the rights in the musical <coughs> work, which is at the core of the onion at all times. So without getting into specifics, depending on the contractual terms, on the territories, the key rights holders who are involved in exploitation music rights are the songwriters, the publishers, and collecting societies as well. So when you think about one musical work, it's relatively simple. If you imagine it's one songwriter who transfers their rights to one publisher or one collecting society, that's fine. Then you think about co-written songs, you think about songs which are sampled, and you think about songs which are Given where a songwriter gives the rights in one territory to one publisher and another territory to another, where the publisher might sub-license those rights on, and you're thinking about a huge, exponentially greater number of rights holders who you've got to clear rights with in order to exploit that music on a pan-European basis. So this is where collective rights management comes in. So it sounds like a great principle get all the rights together, perhaps in a territory by territory basis, go to one collecting society, they'll sort it all out. Unfortunately, it's not this, that simple. So the first collective rights management organization started in 1777 in France, and they've been running since then. So we'll come back to that after we look at the context of the digital market. Can we have the next slide? Cool, so this is where Seven Digital sits in the ecosystem. So our assets are a platform, rights. We push that into a platform and we offer products and services. So we can do anything for clients. We can be the back end, just provide technology, or we can go to shaping an idea to market. We can also provide a fully managed solution to clients. And we do rights consultancy as well. And we often help our clients determine exactly where they want to go into. And that's always dependent on rights, and rights are key. So, the key issues when we're looking at launching a music service and the headaches that people have. So first of all, we look at scoping. So someone says, you know, I'd like the moon on a stick. I'd love to launch a pan-European music service tomorrow. And we say, that's great okay, what are we doing about licensing? And they say, well, I've spoken to the major record labels, it's all fine, sorted. And, then we say, and they say, but can you just do publishing? Just do publishing for us. And we say, okay, sure, 
but I'm not sure you're going to be able to, like, to launch tomorrow. So let's just look at scoping it out first. Let's determine exactly the kind of rights you're going to go for. Are we going to go for blanket licensing? Are we going to go for a bespoke licensing proposal? So that one of the barriers to entry that we find for our clients is that there's just a lot of time and expertise required to even get to that first stage. So then the next stage, when you've decided what you want, is going through licensing negotiation. And that can be quite slow, quite protracted, and quite costly. Obviously, if you want to speed something up, you can throw money at the problem, but not everyone has that money to do that. So then the next problem for clients is metadata. As you may have heard, there's been a little bit of litigation in the US, and I think at the core of that, as everyone's recognized from both sides of the equation, is the lack of metadata, the lack of a global repertoire database, which is what everyone's been looking for and a problem no one's been able to solve. And it's, you know, it's scary for clients trying to get into this. They look at the problem and they say, you know what, maybe I won't go into that territory or that territory. Maybe I'll just stay in the UK, maybe I'll just go to Germany, because I think I can handle that. So then we get to reporting. Now, oops. Okay. So reporting. Obviously, that depends on metadata. Now, the problem with reporting is even if you have it, there's a huge number of different variety of reports required from different societies. So there's a huge burden and cost associated with reporting correctly. And then reconciliation. Again, it all goes back to metadata, so there's a huge cost involved in trying to get this right, and the problem is that the rights holders often have different views on who owns the music in the first place. And often I'm told, when you get to a new release, the rights holders haven't actually decided who owns what, and the proportions which are owned by different publishers. So when you're starting on that basis, reconciliation can be quite difficult. And in quite a lot of cases, we're looking at over 100% claims. So, you know, you're underwater on publishing. So, very quickly, looking at the digital music market. So, we could say that there are three ages of digital music. Skipping quickly. First age, so late 90s, early 1000s, digital piracy. Second, CD replacement. So, we could also call this the download or iTunes age. And this is where we are now, digital expansion. So as you can see there, we've gone from the second age, we've pivoted to streaming. Now there's a huge amount of complexity involved in clearing and licensing and collecting metadata and reporting for streaming. And there's also been a huge flux at the same time in the makeup of all the collective rights management organizations and publishers who deal with licensing rights. So, as I said, if we think that collective rights organizations started in the 1800s and 1777, they obviously weren't designed to deal with pan-European streaming. So we've got legacy collective systems, we've got backends which weren't set up to deal with all of the complexity of minute track by track distribution and there are significant overheads and if you think about having you know one organization in every single territory with every a back end which is different reporting systems which are different reconciliation systems which are different it's very difficult for a digital service provider to actually expend the cost and effort to go out and across all of those territories at the same time so i mean publishers themselves have not been happy with this situation either it's not really working for anyone. So over the last couple of years, publishers have been withdrawing rights from certain organizations. They've also been looking to form joint ventures. And we've seen a kind of fragmentation and then amalgamation again. And there's been a significant amount of change recently. Um, and I think there is you know, some light at the end of the tunnel. If you think about the hub, which has been formed between Gamer, PRS, and STEM, ICE, We've also got the Indie Hub, which is Impel, and we've got further innovation, which is the acquisition by Cobalt of Amara, which is very interesting, and they're trying to position themselves as something different 
for publishers with lower overheads, a very big competitor to the rest of the market. So we hold out hope that the hubs will reduce barriers to entry, speed up processing, and reduce the number of databases involved. So, back to the client. Right to the forefront, when a client comes to us, we say to them, look, you know, they may have a strong desire to get into the music industry, but they're not really sure what they, what they want to do. Or they might have a very strong view of exactly what they want to do, but they haven't quite got the licensing sorted. So we usually go for a phased licensing approach. We'll identify the key launch market, perhaps one as a test market. Um, we'll go out and just sort of present the concept, test the temperature of key rights holders, and see if they're happy with the functionality, if they understand the concept, if they're supported in general. Then we'll look at tackling rights holders in succession. So we'll look at kind of talking to some of the major labels while we're talking to publishers, making sure we're getting deals done in succession. Um, and we may be doing deals on the back of our own deals as a business to business provider, or we may look to do direct deals between the clients and the rights holders. So going very quickly to a case study, um, one of our clients is called The Overflow. So I'm not sure if you've heard, heard of them. It kind of depends if you're into Christian or gospel music. Um, if you are, then you probably have, because they launched in the US and they're looking for further launches elsewhere. So they had a very, very strong business model already. They had a waiting list of excited customers who are absolutely keen to get onto the service as soon as it launched. They'd done a huge amount of marketing. They had loads of support from key stakeholders, record labels, but they hadn't sorted the publishing. So what we did was we went out and we looked at sort of talking to the key publishers one by one. As I said, this kind of phased approach where we discussed the concept and got support for a 4.99 lower cost model due to the restrictive repertoire involved. So yeah, that's one example that we have as a case study for the overflow, right? So let me know if you have any questions. Um, what do you think about platforms that uh, launch ahead of time and then seek licensing later? Do you see any issues with that? Um, and do you work with companies like that later down the road? So if you didn't hear it, the question was, what do you think about platforms who launch ahead of time without getting the licensing? And do we have any clients like that? <coughs> um, so I think in a perfect world, all of the licensing would be sorted. Um, and every single rights holder would have signed a long form agreement, every advance would be paid, everything would be absolutely sorted before the launch date. Um, unfortunately, we don't live in a perfect world. So I think the key thing is to get a kind of handshake agreement, happiness by the rights holder to launch, um, for everyone to be aware, for everyone to be happy that something's going ahead. Um, I think that if there's enough trust there, then rights holders will allow their content to be made available. Otherwise, you know, there could be a problem. But you know, most of our clients are absolutely transparent about what they're doing. So that's the key. Thank you very much.